due to the personal, portable nature of Game Boy systems, Game Boy modding and customization has been popular for quite some time. From as basic as shell and button swaps, to adding backlights and rechargeable batteries. But more recently, the Game Boy scene has been dominated by a variety of new IPS LCD kits that replace the original screens entirely. So how well do these screens perform? And are they something that a modding newbie should be comfortable installing themselves? In this episode, we'll be looking at several kits for the Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance, and the results can be stunning, but not perfect. Is this what you want for your Game Boy? Let's find out. Even though handheld games on the big screen has always kind of been the end game for me personally, something that I've also come to have a renewed appreciation for in recent years is the quick access that just a regular old Game Boy system gives you to whatever game you pop in it. No TV, no controller, no settings to adjust, just power on and go. So the prospect of a more modern screen on these systems started to sound really enticing. Now, when I set out to do these mods, I made a lot of mistakes along the way in terms of what I bought, resulting in a number of redundant pieces, as well as multiple, multiple extra orders, because I realized I wanted various additional parts to make the process go more smoothly. So if you do decide to do any mods, maybe I can save you some grief in that area because I'm honestly feeling a bit sick over how much money I've sunk into this project. And even then, after putting together four kits myself, I still wanted to be able to show more versions to give you as comprehensive of an overview of these mods as we reasonably could do in one video. So I reached out to a delightful YouTube channel called Macho Nacho Productions and asked the owner Tito if he would be willing to collaborate by letting us borrow some of his most recently assembled Game Boy mods. Thanks to him, we're able to show off a total of seven different IPS screen kits between DMG, Pocket, Color, Advance, and SP models. And one last note before we really get into it. This is not a guide video. In fact, we're going to look at how the screens perform first and then discuss the process last. Because these are mods that almost anyone can do, but they are not foolproof and I'll be the first to raise my hand and admit that I am a fool. The purpose of showing the process is to highlight key areas where I had difficulty so that you can decide whether you're comfortable doing such a mod yourself. So to get a better idea for how things should go, check out the beautifully shot assembly and review videos in the Retro Renew series over at Macho Nacho Productions after this episode. But please do not assume that anything you see me do in this video is best practice for installation in any way. So let's jump straight to the point and see if one of these new screens is something that you'd like. There are kits available for nearly the entire Game Boy line. For the most part, these are actually screens manufactured for various applications like smaller, not so smart phones, which have just been co-opted into serving a classic gaming niche. They are, of course, not the correct size or aspect ratio for these systems, but can fit into a Game Boy shell either by modifying the original housing, modifying a reproduction shell, or buying a reproduction shell that already has the necessary space cleared for the new screen. As you might guess, the excess screen real estate is not used, with the game simply being displayed in the area visible through the system's viewing window. The general characteristics across most of these IPS screens are really similar overall. Seeing as how the new screens are much higher resolution than the Game Boy and Game Boy Color's native 160x144, and the Game Boy Advance's 240x160, it's necessary for the image to be scaled. For the DMG01, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance kits that I have, a 2x integer scale cleanly brings the game up to size, where each pixel occupies four pixels on the screen. This is awesome, because I really didn't want to have to say the word shimmering in this video. Although I guess I just did. But thankfully, the specter of non-integer scaling has not haunted us this day. 
However, one of the newest models that we were able to test thanks to Tito is the funny playing Game Boy Pocket screen. Well, my understanding is that earlier IPS kits for the Pocket actually display the game in a smaller window than OEM Pocket screen. The kit from Funny Plane displays very similarly to the original screen size, if not an almost imperceptible amount larger. This particular screen is also such a high resolution that each Game Boy Pixel is a whopping 16 pixels, a 4x scale. It's a little over the top for sure, because the pixel density, even on the 2x scale screens, is so high that you can't realistically perceive the individual pixels with your naked eye. So these extreme close-ups don't at all represent how you'd actually see it in person. For some, this clean presentation might be the ideal way to view Game Boy games. But you know, even though I'm usually not super into artificial scan lines, I do enjoy a good Game Boy dot matrix grid shader or overlay like you might see in emulation or on the GBA consoleizer. And that's where the extra resolution of the funny playing Game Boy Pocket Kit stands above the others and its ability to activate a grid overlay by doing an extra long hold on a touch sensor that you install in the top corner of the shell. It looks pretty awesome overall. If I didn't know any better, you might have fooled me into thinking it was a natural part of the screen's pixel layout. Tito has also installed and reviewed Funny Plane's first DMG kit, which was released after the Pocket Kit, and has similar features, including the larger screen and grid option. Speaking of the DMG and Pocket, you can of course choose from a variety of palettes to give the original Game Boy shades a bit of color. The kit that I installed for my own DMG, the RIPS V3, or RIPS V3, however you say it, has eight palettes, which are cycled through by pressing in on what previously acted as the contrast wheel, now the brightness wheel. To be honest, these palettes aren't super to my taste, being a bit oversaturated. The green one just doesn't feel like Game Boy Green to me at all. I prefer the yellow or black and white palettes the best. The funny playing kits for the DMG and Pocket both feature palettes that are much more to my liking. I count 35 on the pocket, although a ton of them are just really subtle variations. I especially like the look of the green palettes, and I'd say overall the selection is more muted and thoughtful compared to the RIPS palettes. Black levels and viewing angles across these screens tend to be reasonably good, certainly good enough for a single player looking at it straight on. You may notice the edge backlight leaking in from the sides in a dark room with a particularly dark scene, but on the whole, the games are relatively vivid and colorful, which lends well to the perception of high contrast and deep black levels. Striking color reproduction is, after all, typically cited as one of the strengths of IPS LCD panels, but of course you should expect it to feel different from official screens. Compared to an AGS-101, colors tend to be warmer on the IPS panels, which many people may prefer. So, so far so good, right? But while there is this perception that IPS is the best of the best in the LCD world, it does have some cons to go along with its pros, just like any display technology. And as much as I really wish I could say that what you're getting with these Game Boy screen kits is close to perfect, there are a number of issues you might want to be aware of before you buy into it. But first, I want to very, very briefly take a detour to talk about the official Game Boy system that is most comparable to the IPS screens. I am, of course, referring to the AGS-101, the GBA SP that started shipping in 2005 with an actual backlit screen as opposed to a frontlit screen. It's long been my go-to handheld Game Boy machine, but for all the people like me who love it, there are others who absolutely hate the AGS-101 screen. The reason being, it's somewhat slow pixel response. It's never been bad enough from my point of view to stop me from using the system. I mean, it's still way clearer in motion than the original Game Boy systems, but it's an absolute deal breaker for others. I bring this up because all of this screen mod stuff has largely come from people chasing the promise of the AGS-101 screen. In fact, old excess stock of the supposedly exact screens used in the AGS-101 have been bought up by Game Boy fans over the years to install into original horizontal GBA models. These kits are still sold all over the internet, although I can't help but be a bit skeptical if they're the real deal. 
Just take a look at the one Corey ended up with. It's got this strange effect that looks like interlaced video. My unmodified AGS-101 screen does not behave this way. However, my understanding is that some screens Nintendo actually use in manufacturing AGS-101 systems do produce this effect, so Cory's might be real after all. And maybe this difference in screen behavior is part of what contributes to all of the AGS-101 hate out there. Turns out, a lot of us haven't even been looking at the same thing after all. This effect can actually also be observed on the original GBC and GBA screens, but it's hard to see due to the overall dimness. While it has been possible to mod backlights into the original DMG and pocket screens for many years, these outright screen replacements are a relatively newer development. Creators like Ben Venn and McWill have released their own screen replacement kits for the DMG and GBC, although availability seems to be not as high as the IPS replacements. Corey has a McWill Game Boy Color, which features an excellent 2x integer scale, but also highlights one of the pitfalls of mixing Game Boy games with screens they weren't designed for. The McWill GBC has screen tearing issues due to the Game Boy series systems updating their images at a non-standard 59.7 Hz or so, and we've not been able to properly verify whether this problem has yet been fully addressed with the McWill kits. But because these are not IPS screens, they will not be the focus in this episode. Now, I have also spotted tearing on both the funny plane and unbranded IPS screens for GBC, but it seems to be so uncommon in comparison that I haven't managed to capture a clip of it in action. Otherwise, I have not noticed any similar issues on any DMG, Pocket, or GBA IPS screens. After all, kits like the RIPS V3 for DMG and the GBA V2 are numbered as such because it did take a few revisions of the ribbon cables to get to where they are today, with no screen tearing or frame skips, as far as I've seen at least. However, that's not to say that these issues are completely missing from all kits still sold today. If you check Funny Plane's YouTube channel, you'll find a clip where they've posted comparisons of various supposed issues they've spotted in generic unbranded cables versus their own, including periodic drop frames due to a refresh mismatch. Since I was curious to verify their findings on my own, I bought a generic V2 kit to compare against the Funny Plane GBA V2, but I could not spot the same issue in the generic kit I ended up with. The only noticeable difference between the two is that the generic is darker with much worse white balance, the screen is tinted a bit yellow, and has some noticeable uniformity imperfections. On the other hand, my Funny Plane GBC screen and Tito's generic unbranded GBC screen have a very similar appearance. In fact, the generic one is just a touch brighter in this case, but not enough to matter. Now, this is kind of an awkward thing, because if I'm being honest, I'm still skeptical of, like, who originally designed these kits? They just seem to exist. I mean, there are so many of them, so who's cloning whose design? Who's putting in the legwork to improve them? Is it right to call any of these fake or generic? I just don't know. We always advocate buying authentic hardware to support the original creators, but in this particular scene of Game Boy modding, I'm just really confused about who we should be buying from. But the one thing my experience has led me to believe is that Funny Plane may offer a higher degree of consistency, if nothing else. But that is not to say that Funny Plane screens are faultless, and in fact, Funny Plane's YouTube video that I just mentioned starts off with a comparison that is unintentionally unflattering to their own products. So, see, in all of the Game Boy Advance F-Zero titles, the map in the lower left corner flickers. They point this out as a problem with the generic kit, but that's exactly how the map is supposed to behave, as shown in this direct capture from the GBA consoleizer. Be sure you're watching at 60 frames per second to see it. This sort of flicker is pretty common in sprite-based games, so it's disappointing to see it not handled correctly. So what's going on? Well, the unbranded kit that I got did not behave like the generic in the video. Like the funny plane screens, the map doesn't always flicker like it in fact should. Actually, every single IPS screen that I bought for this episode exhibits this behavior, with the exception of the RIPS V3 for the DMG. 
Cloud Castle in Castlevania II Belmont's Revenge is ideal for testing out how the screen handles flicker. Of course, on the original DMG screen, the scene through the windows looks like a solid lighter shade due to the slow pixel response, so you could argue that it not flickering on the other IPS screens, like a Game Boy Color one, is more accurate. But that's still not the full story, because on every GBC and GBA IPS I've tried, flickering elements like this do start off as flickering, but if you let the screen sit still for just a second or so, they begin to stop flickering so much and eventually they seem to become solid. Move again and the flicker resumes. So what's actually going on here is that the flicker is causing temporary image retention on the display. Check out Goemon's shadow here. Since the Game Boy Color cannot do transparency effects, the developers achieved the shadow by making it flicker at 60 Hz. As Goemon's position on the screen changes, you can see an after image of where the shadow had been. This is easily something that you would likely cause from playing the game completely normally. It's not just because I'm trying to show it here. If we go back to F-Zero and give up on the race, when the map is removed from the display, you can see the after image for a moment before it fades away. This specific type of image retention, caused by rapid flicker, is a characteristic of IPS screens that we've observed before. Not necessarily all IPS screens, but it is a thing. Luckily, I've never heard of anyone getting permanent burn-in on IPS screen from flicker effects, such as with Bob the interlacing of 480i video game sources, but it is likely to cause temporary retention, and it is disconcerting. If you let a flicker effect like this glow around Link linger for a moment, once gameplay begins, you won't necessarily see the details of the image retention, but instead you might notice that the pixels in that region over the background don't calm down for a while, continuing to flicker. The speed at which this retention happens is just alarming. Watch how the 160p test suite tools retain a black and white flicker as a pinkish hue within a second or two and how the flicker continues when I back out to the main menu. I've also observed this same lingering flicker on the funny playing Game Boy Pocket to a less extreme degree. I have two theories for why this is happening on these Game Boy IPS screens. The most straightforward answer is that the flickering elements on screen simply stop flickering because image retention is setting in. But before I realized you could see the after image retained and fade away, I wondered if what was going on was not simply image retention, but some sort of smart feature, either from the ribbon cable or the screen itself, which might be actively fighting against flickering as an anti-retention effect. I mean, it sets in so crazy fast, I just can't help but wonder if there's more to it. Surely not, right? I mean, I know the flicker was meant to be masked by the original screen, but come on, let's not kid ourselves into treating image retention like it's a feature. As an aside, this specific type of image retention seems to not occur on the Benvin or McWill screens, which are TFT LCD panels rather than IPS. One more flicker observation and I swear I'll shut up. On the RIPS V3 screen kit that I installed in the DMG Game Boy, the middle tones actually flicker constantly. And this time I'm talking about stuff that isn't supposed to flicker, like just the regular sprites and backgrounds. It's more noticeable on certain palettes than others, very visible on the best ones in my opinion, but the effect does become less pronounced if you reduce the brightness. If I pause the clips here, you can see that there's a sort of scan line effect. It flickers rapidly like interlaced video. To be fair, I guess it's kind of like those AGS-101 screens that have a similar effect, the ones that you hope you don't end up with, but it's a disappointing flaw that I wish I didn't notice, and I'm sorry I just made you notice. Luckily, much like with the Funny Plane Game Boy Pocket Kit, I understand that this is not an issue with the Funny Plane DMG Kit. But as impressive as those kits are, they aren't without their own set of quirks. As spotted by Tito, the Link's Awakening title screen has a series of flickering dots that shouldn't be there. This error is consistently reproducible, occurring only in specific spots in certain games, but to be clear, I have not been able to find very many examples to show here. 
In addition, when using the awesome grid scan line feature, white screen transitions, which are very common on Game Boy, exhibit some glitchy artifacts. Funny Plane has released a statement about some issue being fixed, but it's not clear which one. Regardless, Tito did still have these two glitches on the DMG Funny Plane kit he installed in the video on his channel, which was purchased after Funny Plane's message. And Emlig viewer Choirboy bought a Funny Plane Game Boy Pocket kit very closely to this video's release, and provide video confirming that both issues are still present on his kit. But at any rate, as a fun aside, I learned about why the screen transition glitch most likely happens from MLIG viewer MK Iron Fist. It's because the Game Boy actually turns the display off during white screen transitions. Ultimately, all the hubbub surrounding these IPS kits boils down to their high availability and that they edge out the AGS-101 screen in its weakest area pixel response. And indeed, while I think the complaints about AGS-101 ghosting are a bit blown out of proportion, in a straightforward comparison, the IPS screens do seem to perform better. It ain't perfect or nothing, but you know, the motion is less blurry and I have appreciated that. But oh, how I wish it were so straightforward. In a vast majority of situations, I find that the IPS kits do admirably when it comes to refreshing the pixels rapidly but there are other times where the illusion breaks down and creates some of the absolute weirdest ghosting artifacts that I've ever seen on LCD screen. Did you notice anything weird as the nifty GBA exclusive intro for Super Mario World played? Let's take a look again in slow motion. You seen it? You seen it? All right, I know you already think I'm crazy, but there are some really odd looking trails left behind certain objects against certain backgrounds. Watch this jumping piranha plant as it scrolls off screen. It leaves a huge stream of multiple after images. A much less subtle example of this effect can be demonstrated with Lady Sia. I think the bold dark outlines around the characters and backgrounds combined with the flat shading style causes this problem to just go out of control. When I first saw it, I thought it almost looked like a sort of analog noise, not at all the type of LCD ghosting I'm used to seeing, and the AGS-101 most definitely does not behave this way. Eh, okay, but whatever, Lady C is just some obscure little GBA game, and most games that have more complex shading tend to not show this issue. But what about something a bit more popular? Watching Pokemon Fire Red have the pattern on this roof repeats across the top of the screen as I run left and right. This demonstrates why this effect is driving me absolutely nuts. It's not just a simple matter of slow pixel response because for one, the after images don't fade in the slightest until I stop running. And secondly, there's this weird flicker when they do begin to fade. So my suspicion is that the screen scrolling with certain patterns at certain speeds is actually causing brief image retention. It sounds absolutely insane, I know, but just like with the whole image retention thing, I can't help but wonder if there's some piece of technology that is causing the screen to overreact to certain types of motion and actively work against it. I mean, I'm no engineer, so if anyone has an explanation, I'd love to hear it because while it doesn't necessarily ruin the experience of using these screens, it has got to be the absolute weirdest visual artifact I've seen in all of my years analyzing display technologies for old video games. This problem is on every Game Boy Advance and GBA SP IPS screen I've tested, and I've also spotted it on both GBC screens I have on hand, but the visuals in most GBC games seem to not trigger the issue as frequently. But luckily, I've not noticed it on any DMG or Pocket IPS screens. When the wavy scrolling artifacts aren't rearing their ugly heads, the general pixel response across these IPS screens seems to be similar. Not perfect, as you may have heard, but certainly solid overall. <coughs> I'm okay. Uh. 
one more thing that you should be aware of is that these screen mods tend to use a frame buffer for various reasons, such as for preventing tearing or stutter, as well as for working around the fact that many of these screens are placed into the systems vertically, but the games and screens are both designed to draw each frame from top to bottom, so the image has to be rotated. In other words, we're looking at probably around a frame of added lag, but we don't have a way to get more precise measurements with this hardware. It's not enough for me to notice, but just in case you're ultra sensitive to lag, I thought you should know. And actually, there's more to consider with how the games feel to play than just lag. If you're using reproduction shells, reproduction button membranes, or reproduction D-pads and buttons, all of those can have a huge impact on the feel of using the system. The DMG mods are the trickiest in this regard because the DMG system is in two pieces. The actual console is the back half, while the screen is attached to a front board that controls various functions like the speaker and button inputs. Because of this, all DMG screen mods come with a new PCB that replaces the old front PCB. And I think this has something to do with why the buttons and D-pad just don't feel great. Something about how everything fits in there. Diagonals don't feel right, the buttons feel wrong, the way they mash in out of the shell is just not ideal at all. The mods for non-DMG Game Boy systems do not require this board swap, but depending on what parts are used in assembling the system, the system may still feel different to play. With my funny playing Game Boy Advance, I used a reproduction front half of the shell, original D-pad face buttons and membranes, reproduction R and L buttons, and an original back shell. Of the ones I built, this one feels the best by far. It really feels great to play actually, no issues at all. The second GBA I put together with the unbranded IPS screen though, feels less good. The entire shell and all of the buttons are repros. Even though I used the original button membranes, the actual buttons just feel less nice to use compared to real ones. The Game Boy Color I did is a reproduction shell, reproduction buttons, and original membranes, and feels good to use in most regards, but the up on the D-pad is very crunchy and inconsistent. That's probably because you have to cut into the area inside the D-pad pivot area as well as the D-pad membrane so that it will fit around the oversized LCD screen you're putting inside. I don't know if I cut too much or too little, but this is one area where a neophyte modder like me might struggle. On the other hand, I have no complaints about the systems Tito let me borrow. The Game Boy Pocket uses all original Nintendo shell, buttons, and membranes and feels perfect to play on. The GBA SP uses reproduction parts, but still manages to mimic that clicky feel of an OEM GBA SP. His Game Boy Color is the coolest of all, sporting a metallic body fitted for a rechargeable battery, along with a metal D-pad and buttons. I was pretty unsure about this at first, but I could definitely see myself redoing some of my mods with parts like these. The weight of the system is great and the buttons feel amazing to use. Not to mention it seems he didn't struggle with getting the D-pad to work just right, unlike my green one. And you know, maybe he just knows how to pick better parts than I do, but I think there's also something to be said about the skill and experience of the person putting the mods together. If you made some bad cuts or if you screwed the system back together too tightly or too loosely, these things can absolutely have an impact on how the system feels in your hands and how the buttons respond. And if I'm being honest, I found all of these IPS mods to be a stressful and frustrating process. Seriously, no one should watch my life in gaming and assume we're mod masters. We just know how to analyze and appreciate the results of the mods that other people usually installed for us. And all of this really reinforced that for me. Because to get the most out of Game Boy modding, I think you really have to be in it for the joy of the process more than anything. This may not even be your Game Boy's final form. Later on, you'll probably see another mod you want to swap in. So I don't want to discourage anyone from jumping into this because I can see how it really could be a lot of fun to continue customizing your Game Boys. But if you're thinking about doing these mods and are sitting over here with me and the rest of the modding dummies, here are a few things you'll need to be prepared to do. One reason I think Game Boy mods are so popular is that for the most part, they require little to no soldering. But there are a few things that you may need to be prepared to solder, or at least get some help with. 
For instance, I went and got some help from Zach down at Video Game World in Huntersville, North Carolina to get my DMG speaker moved from the system's front board to the new board, which is required for any DMG screen mod if, you know, you want sound without headphones. I mean, maybe I could learn something. It's probably a great starter project for soldering, but eh, you know, I just wasn't feeling it. Likewise, certain other mods like for the Game Boy Advance require soldering for adding brightness control to the R and L buttons while holding select. I decided to forego this to keep things simple and improve battery life. The default brightness on the funny plane compares very favorably to the max brightness on the AGS-101, so in my opinion, more brightness is not needed. I really appreciate that the funny plane Game Boy Color Kit has a pre-soldered touch sensor for brightness control that you can mount under the infrared plate, but I really had to work at the plastic to fit it in. Speaking of which, if you don't purchase a system shell that is built specifically for the IPS screens, you'll need to clear out a lot of plastic. I decide I would not use an original case for this since I'm so new to Game Boy modding and reproduction cases are really inexpensive. While they don't necessarily have the same feel as the real shells, they often have Nintendo branding on them so you can pretend they're real. The first one I tried to modify was a red reproduction DMG shell and it went okay up until I tried sanding down the nubs without protecting the front exterior, which scuffed it up a bit. So I decided to instead order what was called a prestige shell that I wouldn't need to cut up. When I did do modifications to my reproduction Game Boy Color shell, I protected the face with a soft cloth and the process was overall smoother than I expected, in part because the plastic in these reproduction cases is extremely soft and malleable. You just have to be sure to not cut or bend parts that you need to keep intact. I found that it was quite easy to remove a lot of material by simply making small serrations with a utility knife and cutting out the sections bit by bit. But again, this is not a guide. Just an example of what a person with limited tools and a low level of handiness might resort to doing. While the soft plastic in these reproduction shells makes them easy to modify and probably cheaper to produce, one downside is that I found it very easy to strip the screw holes when putting my systems back together. With my funny playing GBA, I used a reproduction front half that was pre-fitted for an IPS screen and an OEM back half to give the screw something a bit more solid to work into. This resulted in by far the best feeling system that I put together. In addition to changing my mind a couple of times about what kinds of shells I wanted to use, Another issue that caused me to make excessive redundant orders was how you mount the screens. These screens come with double-sided tape, but from what I've heard, if you screw up or if you decide you want to reshell your system, you're pretty much gonna ruin the screen if you've taped it in. I was gonna do this at first, but chickened out at the last second. Instead, almost any guide that you find about this stuff online will recommend buying a very cheap 3D printed bracket that will hold the screen in place. And this is definitely what you should do so that you don't only have one shot to align the screen correctly and screw it up. In fact, I found it to be easy to be confused and put the screen in upside down in a few situations. If you don't put it in correctly, your ribbon cables will end up backwards and it won't work at all. Sometimes it can be a little confusing, to me anyway, which way the ribbon cables should run, but once you see it, it makes sense. Since Game Boy Advance systems may have 32-pin or 40-pin ribbon cable connectors, GBA kits have both, so just make sure you tuck the other end away and have it oriented so that you can run the correct one the way it needs to go. Also be aware that there are little tabs that you should pull out and then push back in on GBC and GBA systems to unlock and lock the ribbon cable in place. You might also need to have some form of electrical tape around. I missed this step on a GBA tutorial and the system didn't work at first. After opening it back up, putting electrical tape in place and fiddling a bit more with the ribbon cable lock, it worked. No idea if the lack of tape was actually causing like a short or something, but take that for what you will. By far the most out of my wheelhouse thing I did for these mods was cutting the excess metal from the through hole solder joints on the Game Boy Color cartridge connector and upper battery terminal. These need to be trimmed down a bit because the GBC IPS makes the system really tightly packed. And I had absolutely the wrong trimming tool for this. It was way too big. Don't look at this. This is making you sick. It's making me sick too. 
But at any rate, after covering up the ugliness with electrical tape, the system closed up fine and it does work, so good enough for now, I guess, but please try to do a better job than me. The final piece is the self-adhesive screen cover, or lens as I've also seen it called. With the official Nintendo branding, these often look pretty close to official, which is great because most Game Boys out there could really stand to use a new screen cover, even if the screen itself isn't being replaced. Typically, a plastic one will come with most reproduction shells, but tempered glass lenses are also available. Tempered glass seems to get the most oohs and ahs, but I think they can actually have some disadvantages. I didn't find that tempered glass necessarily looked much better, although I'm sure it's more scratch resistant. But with the tempered glass screen cover I put on this GBA, there's a small imperfection in the lower left of the viewing window that I immediately spotted after it was applied and the system was turned on. On the other GBA, the tempered glass wouldn't even sit right, and I replaced it with the plastic screen protector that came with the shell in the first place, which fit much better. Likewise, with the Game Boy Color, I got a speck of dust underneath while applying the cover, and it wasn't fitting so great anyway. But while trying to remove the cover, it cracked a bit. And then I still got another speck of dust on the screen while applying the plastic one. But I'm done, not opening it. Not anytime soon anyway. For me, this was not a fun process. Maybe it sounds like I've been uncharacteristically negative, but the IPS screens in most gameplay situations, I actually would say are better than the AGS-101. But what bothers me is the inconsistency. With the AGS-101, it behaves the way it behaves and you know what you're getting out of it no matter which game you play. But with these IPS screens, maybe you were looking forward to playing a particular game on your system, but with that specific game, your mod is producing a visual artifact that you just can't stop staring at image retention, bizarre ghosting, stuff like that. I really hope that someday in the not so distant future, companies like Funny Plane or Community Modders will come up with new solutions that will wipe out the problems with the current crop of mods. And I hope that channels like Macho Nacho Productions will continue to keep us informed about the latest kits. But for now, if you love the idea of tinkering with Game Boys, go ahead and hack away. But if you're like me and just want to enjoy using the best possible screen mod, I'd recommend waiting at least a little while longer. This episode of My Life in Gaming was sponsored by Skillshare. If only we can enhance our everyday intelligence attributes by fighting monsters in the overworld, or by finding random seeds left haphazardly in people's cupboards, right? In the real world, we have Skillshare, an online community with a vast reservoir of virtual classes for those who are inspired to expand their knowledge. Whether it be something you've always been curious to learn about, like UX design, or discovering new facets of something you're already passionate about, like video editing. Learn to take better photos with your camera phone, or Figure out how something like Google Analytics work in over 25,000 classes taught by veterans of their respective industries. There's something for everyone on Skillshare, and if you join using the link in the description, you'll get a two-month free trial where you can take unlimited classes and make the most of your downtime. I personally struggle a lot with script writing, so I've spent a bit of my time on Skillshare looking for classes to make that process more natural to me. On a more personal note, working freelance, working on this show, having kids, and simply finding enough time to play whatever game I've been looking forward to, well, time management can be a real challenge sometimes. To help with that, I've really been digging Ali Abdel's Productivity Masterclass. Join Skillshare and get a two-month trial using the link in the description.